Praise Jesus. Wonderful to be with God's people today on a Sunday morning. Biblically speaking, it's the beginning of the week. So you started the week right by coming to fellowship and studying God's Word. I know our normal, you would say, um, secular calendar is Monday morning. That's when they expect you to be either at work, school, or whatever, right? Um, the first day of the week in the Bible, it's always been Sunday. The disciples got together on the first day of the week to celebrate Jesus' resurrection, and so are we. So praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Uh, just a couple of things uh, wasn't mentioned on the, on the announcement uh, Wednesday night. Uh, I know the kids got their own class in the back. That's awesome. The adults have their own class here, a Wednesday night Bible study service here, and we're starting the book of James. One particular thing about James is a lot of people don't like to study James. And um, once you study it, you'll know why. Once you study it, you'll know why. It is in, in very convicting. It speaks of quite a bit of things that are, are dwelt within, dealt in the church, I should say, dealt in the church. It speaks of the tongue. It speaks of your attitudes. It speaks of favoritism. It speaks of so many things that a lot of Christians continue on somehow, some way. They, because they don't read the book of James, they just dwell with it and just figure that that's a normal Christian life. And James says, no, 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 no. That's actually a sin against God. And so it corrects us, and it brings us back into right relationship with God, the right worship. So Wednesday night, very convicting book, the book of James. It speaks from experience and very convicting to all of us. And it deals with backsliding. It deals with backsliding, and what an antidote to backsliding. You feel like you're heading in that direction. Your heart is, is telling you, hey, you're not, a, you're not reading as you used to pray and as you used to read the book of James. It puts you right back into where you need to be. So on Wednesday nights, we'll be studying that. There's five chapters, and um, we'll be studying them carefully because it does speak of wisdom and the coming of the Lord and how we're to live. So that's Wednesday night, and I'm um, looking forward to that on Wednesdays. And uh, we talked about the, yeah, so Saturday, Sunday, Roy mentioned the conference. Uh, it's like a mini conference, really, uh, 9th and 10th of March. And I'm looking forward to so much hearing Dave Rosetto speak and uh, from New York, wonderful testimony. Don't want to miss him. And then we have baptism on Sunday morning, so after service. So look forward to that. And if you have questions, please let us know. Let's pray and ask the Lord for his help and understanding this wonderful text, John 14. Lord, we are so dependent on you. We don't even realize it. We don't even realize today we woke up because of your great mercy. We came here because of your great mercy. Lord God, our, our bodies are functioning, whether they're sick or not. We're here because you gave us mercy, and we're dependent on every breath for you, for you to give that to us. And so, Lord, we apply ourselves to you today, reading your word and understanding it. Lord, we ask you for your help. For un we're unable to do so, Lord, without your touch and without your help of your Holy Spirit. And, uh, Lord, illuminate your word to us and help us, Lord, not to just read it and hear it and think that that's all we are called to do, Lord God, but help us to apply it in our lives. As it were, Lord, if it says to love one another, Lord, may we go out of our way today to love other believers. Lord, if it says to forgive, then Lord, may we so quick to forgive and reconcile, Lord. These things are what you have called us to do. So, Lord, as we read the, the time our Lord spent with his disciples, we pray he would be speaking, as it were, to them, but also to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the night before the Lord was crucified. So the very fascinating chapters of John, from chapter 14 to chapter, actually 13 to 17, they're called the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. Why? Because there's things in there that are recorded nowhere else in the world except this book. And we are so blessed to have it because Jesus is about to go to his uh, betrayal at the Garden of Gethsemane, to his cross, to his beatings and, and scourging, to ultimately his death and ultimately his resurrection. There will be six trials that he's going to endure in a few hours from this book in John, John chapter, uh, chapter 14. Uh, a few hours later, he will be betrayed. He will be tried falsely. And he would be handed over to the Romans. Horrible things are coming to pass to the Lord Jesus. Ultimately, the great triumph of the resurrection. But just think about this. He is spending time with them, the 11 of them. We know Judas has already gone out. And he is going to betray Jesus. He's preparing the way for his betrayal. 
and he is spending time with them. There's going to be this, uh, we're not going to call them sermons because they're not sermons of Jesus. Sometimes pastors call them sermons. They're not sermons, they're discourses, meaning conversations that he's had with his disciples. When things are going to, coming to an end, when Jesus knew the cross was coming to an end, what do you normally talk about, right? You talk about the most important things. And so here's Jesus talking about the most important things that disciples are to know before he leaves them. Because in a short time, he will leave them, spend time with them at the resurrection, and then he will ultimately leave them and leave his Holy Spirit in his place. And so there's quite a bit of things he needs to talk to them about. And John, look at the last verse in chapter 31, uh, sorry, chapter 14, verse 31. The last verse in chapter 14, just to look ahead. Jesus says, but that the world may know that I love the Father, I, uh, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Let's get up and let us go from here. So chapter 14, when it ends, Jesus leaves the upper room. He leaves the dinner table, the upper room where they had the Passover meal. And he heads out into Jerusalem. Chapter 15, he might have looked at a vine coming over the wall of a, a certain area. And he begins to talk to them about the vine and how he is the, uh, the vine and they are the branches. And as he walks over the brook of Kidron, going up to Gethsemane, he gives another discourse on the Holy Spirit, chapter 16. And as he's heading toward the Garden of Gethsemane, he stops and he prays. And that's recorded in chapter 17, his prayer to the Father, that we are so privileged to have been recorded here. This is the amazing thing because John is there hearing this, watching Jesus, listening to Jesus, and it's recorded for us word for word as the Holy Spirit gave them reminder, gave them a memory to remember the things that Jesus said. So the very last hours of Jesus and uh, these conversations, these conversations uh, today, this conversation is going to be surrounded the wonderful statement of Jesus of I am. I am. And he's going to, we're going to remember that because he's going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And he's going to speak of the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you look at verse 26, I know we're jumping around from, not from our text yet, but look at verse 26. The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've taught you. How does John remember every single thing that Jesus said in this conversations? Because the Holy Spirit brought to memory what he said. And here's John, an old man writing the gospel, remembering what Jesus said years and years before, and that's why we're able to read it here in the Vore in 2024. Incredible miracle, isn't it? That John was there, privileged to hear all that Jesus had to say, and the Holy Spirit, as an old man, brings to memory all the things that Jesus said that night, and he wrote them down in this book, and it's presented to you. Amazing privilege here in Devor, so we can read what happened 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus is going to explain uh, what it means to be a disciple. He's going to explain things uh, about going forward in the church. What does it mean to be a disciple in the church? The promise of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be quite interesting because he is going to become, the Holy Spirit, the big part of how the church stays together. How believers stay together is the Holy Spirit and the empowerment, the power that we need to live a Christian life. Because otherwise, we would all fail. We would all fail miserably without the Holy Spirit. So how do we become his body? How do we stay together as a church? I Meaning all believers, right? And so the oneness of the Trinity, it's mentioned in this few chapters, and the wonders of the Trinity, the reality that God is three and one, it's also the reality of what Jesus wants to have in us, a unity. Just as God is one, three and one, so we're also many members, right? But yet one body. And that is the point that the, the, the prayer and the point of Jesus' discourse here is that the reality that we are one body, yet many members. As, as much as the unity is in the Godhead, the Trinity, there also needs to be a unity in the church. Many, yet one. Many, yet one. So let's jump into chapter 14, because chapter 14 begins, verse 1, with a response to Peter. This is the whole reason why this verse is even given. Look at chapter 13, verse 37. Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? 
uh, I will lay down my life for you. So Jesus had told them that where he's going, the cross, his death, his resurrection, the believers, the disciples cannot come. This is something that Jesus can only do himself. He is the atonement. He is the propitiation. Fancy word means he's the only one that can stand in our place and deviate the wrath of God towards sin. He's the only one that can take on that wrath, the only one that can take on the sin of the world and die for the sin of the world because he had not sinned. He becomes the sacrificial lamb, the sacrifice that God accepts. Where he goes, they cannot come. And so Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus gives them the reality, right? The next verse, Peter, um, you're going to deny me. You're going to say you don't even know me in a few hours. That must have struck Peter to the heart because you don't hear from Peter for another entire five chapters. He doesn't say a word about it. Can you imagine that kind of, uh, you know, you're so zealous for the Lord and you speak ahead because you're trusting in yourself that you will always be with the Lord and you're not going to deny him only to be told by Jesus. Yeah, you will. You will fall. You will have a denial. And he doesn't speak anymore. And Jesus responds. He keeps going in chapter 14. He responds to what Peter is saying. Don't be troubled by this. Then Thomas interrupts in verse 5. Then Jesus responds to that. Then Philip interrupts, and Jesus responds to that. And then Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas and the disciples, he interrupts, and Jesus responds. You see how this is not a sermon. What Jesus is saying is not a sermon. It's literally a conversation that he's having with his disciples. And as he's saying these things, they have questions, and so do I. And so he responds to those questions in a very loving way, knowing the cross is right around the corner, and his betrayal is at hand, they did not understand certain things, so Jesus tells them and corrects them. And so uh, chapter 14 begins with what Peter had asked. Lord, why can't we come? And the Lord says, you're going to deny me? Would have troubled Peter. Verse 1, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. The disciples were troubled by all that Jesus was saying. He was talking about his betrayer, his denier, and the things that would happen to him. And how can they go on without Christ? I mean, you think about it today. How could you go on without Christ? Life would be unthinkable. Imagine tomorrow you had no relationship with Jesus. It would be unthinkable. It would be the worst day you could possibly ever had. And that is how the disciples looked at it. What do you mean, Jesus? We're not going to have you here anymore. You've been our best friend. You've been our Lord. You've been teaching us. How I can't fathom you not being in my life. And it was devastating. It would have been devastating. But what does the Lord confirm here? Don't be troubled by this. Don't be troubled because, there's, look at verse 1 again. You have to believe in me. You believe in God, but you also have to believe in me. Why? Because by believing in me, you're actually believing in God. By believing in God, you're believing in me. And this is something that in, in Jesus' mind, and as he's talking to them, our Lord is very kind. Notice this. Look at verse uh, 27. My peace I leave to you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace, right? Do not let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. Again, it's the same thing, isn't it? The very same thing that he's told them at the beginning, he tells them at the end of the chapter. Why? Because their hearts were troubled and they needed peace. It's one thing that Jesus is it's so kind to his disciples. Think about what the horrible things he is going to endure in a few hours. And yet his concern as a good shepherd is the welfare of their sheep. How they're going to feel. What they're going to deal with. How they're going to be able to stand. How they're going to be looking at Jesus. Mutilated. Death on a cross buried, right? They would have been shocked. They would have been, this is, this is improbable. This is not only improbable, we never thought this could actually ever happen to Jesus. And yet he is preparing them for something that they're going to be dealing with, is that the death of Jesus was going to trouble them, and what they needed more than anything was peace, was peace. Words of peace. This chapter gives us Peace, doesn't it? It's filled with peace. It's filled with this comfort that no matter what is going to happen over the next few hours or day into Friday afternoon, your emotions need to stay in line with my will. 
Because we're te- we tend to go emotionally distraught when things go bad, don't we? Amen? <laughs> and uh, so do I. And emotions can really, really wreck our faith, doesn't it? In fact, many times our emotions take over our faith because of fear, distraught, emotions uh, just spill over us because why? Things are not what we expected them. The disciples, even though they're told this, they're ex- Jesus knows that they're going to face something very, very difficult, is that they will be apart from Jesus, they would see a brutal death, and they would have no hope. But Jesus has given them hope here because this chapter is about encouragement and hope and peace that they're going to need because of what they're going to endure. They're going to physically see something terrible in the life of Jesus, and yet they have to trust that what he's saying is going to happen, and that's not the end. You believe in God? Well, believe in me, right? The same hope you have in God, it's the same hope you need to have in me. In other words, the word trust is the word here, believe. It's you trust in God, trust in me, right? Trust what I'm telling you, and trust that whatever is going to happen, right, Whatever hard things begin to happen, you trust that I told you that these things will come to pass. But at the end, there's a glorious thing that is going to come. Resurrection, right? So Jesus, is, it's encouraging them. And he speaks to them. And he says, as the Father, as you believe in the Father and you trust the Father, uh, you must also trust in me. Let's look at verse 2. Because here's Jesus going to now explain that when you come to the Father, right, you're actually coming to Jesus, and through him you come to the Father. So we believe that you can come to God. But actually what Jesus is saying, by coming to Jesus, you actually come to God. Look at verse 2. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. I prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself. Where I am, you may be there also. Now this is wonderful promises here. Again, The Lord is encouraging them. Jesus, where is he going? He's going to the cross. After the cross, the resurrection. After the resurrection, he's going to the Father, right? So he had been telling them, I go to my Father. He's going to go there. And that would have troubled them because, Lord, where, you know, can we go? Peter says, no, you can't go. Because even after the resurrection, you're not able to go to heaven yet, Peter. You're going to have to dwell here. Well, Lord, I'm ready to die with you. Well, you can't come, Peter. And where I go, back to the Father, you can't go. Not yet. There's work to do. Well, we'll leave you on the earth. But know this, that when I go to the Father's house, there are many dwelling places. There are many, many dwelling places. And I'm not lying. This is actually true, is what Jesus is saying. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, this word, this is where it gets interesting. The word dwelling places. Does anyone here have the word mansion? Mansion in your translation? Some of us, okay, some of us do. Okay, the word mansions, right? And, and this is where people have misunderstood and, and really misunderstood this verse, thinking that it's going to be some kind of rich place in heaven. You're going to have your own mansion. And, and, and there are people who promise you things that are just really not true. Now, the word mansion here, we don't speak English anymore. I just want to let you know that. We, we speak American. We speak American. And, and English is sort of a, a, a forgotten art, right? If you... Try to read a book from the 1800s, and um, you'll, be, you'll, you'll know that we don't speak English anymore. And uh, you, you almost need a translator for that. The word mansion in the old English way of doing things, and when William Tyndale translated the Bible into English, the word mansion simply, meant, uh, simply meant just a large dwelling place. A large dwelling place, meaning a house that had a lot of different dwelling places. And that was as best as translations can get at the time. And it's basically the old English word for a large room. That's all it meant. has no idea of mansion. It did not mean some kind of rich place where you're going to inherit all these things and, and have your place, you know, <laughs> with, with, the, with the multimillionaires in heaven. Yes, there will be great riches in heaven, but that's not talking about the money. It's talking about dwelling. Now, look at chapter 14 again, and look at verse 16, when Jesus tells him about the Holy Spirit. And what does he say? I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. Now, does anyone have the word dwell? Where it says, I will give you the Holy Spirit, and he will dwell in you forever. Anybody have the word dwell? No? Everybody have the word with you. Okay. So the word with you there, it's just a funny way of translating the word dwell. Literally, it says, the Holy Spirit will dwell with you. Will dwell with you. 
Now look at verse 23, same chapter, same chapter, verse 23. Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Another translation, our abode with him. He will dwell in us, right? Do you have the word abode? Have the word dwell? It is the same word that is in use in verse 2. In my father's house are many dwelling places, many abodes, many places to dwell in, right? It is the same word that is used in verse 16, when the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And in verse 23, where the Father and the Son come into a believer's life, a believer's physical body, and they dwell within that person. Uniquely, isn't it? The whole Godhead, through the Holy Spirit, is represented in that person's life, the believer's life. The, the Godhead dwells within the believer through the Holy Spirit. The word dwell. Okay, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The Father, if you love him, Jesus, if you keep his word, my Father will love him, and he and we will come into him. The abode, the dwelling, okay? Same verse 2, same as verse 2. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, many abodes. The emphasis is not in the, <laughs> in the structure or the building or the mansion. The emphasis is on dwelling, dwelling, okay? The emphasis is the relationship. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and God and Jesus, the Father and Jesus, come into you and dwell in you, then one day, in the Father's house, in eternity, we will dwell not only with God, but we will dwell together in unity, a full unity. This is what he's referring to. It's unity. It's dwelling. The unity that comes from God, the unity that is already in God, will be there in eternity. We're going to inherit that. When we arrive in eternity, we were going to have a dwelling place with God. He will dwell with us. We will dwell with him. We will dwell with each other. But what do we do between then, you know, between now and then? What do we do between now and then? It's the unity that God wants. It's now. You are to reflect that unity. You are to reflect that heavenly relationship that already exists with God and we will have with God in eternity, that relationship is going to have to be reflected here. This is the incredible thing what Jesus is saying. By saying my dwelling place, is saying you're going to have to have it. You're going to have to have it here. Because the relationship that you're going to have in eternity has to be reflected in what you do here. And so from the rest of the chapter, like the next four chapters, it's going to all be about unity in Christ, unity in the Spirit, unity with God, unity with one another. And it's quite amazing because it's like a family, isn't it? It's like a family that God is building in this world. Now let's turn to the book of Ephesians because Paul did address this uniquely in the book of Ephesians. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and you'll see it. You'll see what Paul is saying here in verse 15. It's a great verse. Paul is speaking of the Father. Actually, we'll start on verse 14. He's speaking of the Father. For this reason, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. I bow my knees before the Father. From whom every family, from whom every family, or the whole family, you could say, on, in heaven and on earth, derives his name. What is Paul trying to say here? Families on heaven and families on earth derived from God. It was God's idea. It's, it's a unique idea. Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Have children, right? God has a family. God wants a family because God is like a family unit, right? There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit. He created the angels, he created us. And yes, what he wants from all his creation, he wants a unity. And so all families in heaven and on earth need to have the same goal, the same character, and that character is from the Father. Those characters come from the Father. So a family unity comes from God. A family unity comes from God. And there is to reflect God the Father that comes from him. Not just here on earth, but also eternity. In eternity, there will be a family unit. Now, it doesn't mean, I'm trying to say, it doesn't mean your family here physically will be the same family in, in heaven. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm talking about believers, believing family, like a church body, like believers, body of Christ all over the world. We'll have this unity here. We'll have the unity in heaven. But where does it come from? From comes from God. And so the idea of dwelling together should be the character 
right, of a Bible teaching ministry or a Bible teaching church. Dwelling together should be the character of every family, by the way, too. Um, I almost wanted to go and deviate on this and I'm, I'm talking about families because families, just like a church, it's the same thing. Families, just like a church. But as you see here, where does it derive from? It derives from the father. So guess what, dads? <laughs> you want to have family unity in your house? Guess who it reflects? It reflects the father. Absolutely it does. And when the family unity is not right, maybe it's the wife's maybe fault. Maybe it is the wife's problem. Maybe it is the children who don't behave and don't. But guess whose problem it is to fix? It is the father. It is the father who reflects family. You know, so your family's in shambles. Guess who God's given you responsibility to, to deal with and fix? Our fathers, right? So it's a whole other study for another time. We'll, maybe we'll deal with that another time. But it is very applicable, you know. When things go wrong, right, in the marriage or in family relationships, God always looks to the father because it is the character of the father that it's in every family. Every family needs to reflect the father in heaven through the father on earth. So uh, there are difficulties, isn't it? Because some families don't have fathers. Uh, or some families don't have fathers that want to be involved, which is another whole problem, isn't it? And, and so the, the principle, of, the, of course, is dealing with family. But anyway, back to the point of believers. The principle of abiding, though, the dwelling, uh, go to John chapter 15. Go back to John. It's within the same, same portion of Scripture, by the way. We haven't left too much. Just the next chapter over from where Jesus is talking about. The principle of abiding. Look at verse 10 and 11. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will dwell. The words say dwell, dwelling, right? You will dwell or you would abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I, and I abide, same word, in his love. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, dwell in you, and that your joy may be full. So the principle of abiding and dwelling together is joy and love. Joy and love. And God desires to dwell with us in love and in joy. Notice that. And to have a family and God wants to have a family that's full of love and full of joy. Interesting, isn't it? That at the end of everything, if we're going to keep his commandments, we're going to have something resulting in wonderful things, love and joy. Now, every family probably here and every family that I possibly could remember in my life wants those two things in their lives. They want to have a family full of love and they want to have a family full of joy. In fact, as you get older right, and you have grandparents, Right? Grandparents, all they want is the kids to get along and love each other, right? And have joy. I mean, that's the, you know, why fight? Yeah, that's what they say. Now, sometimes it's a lot more complicated and there are issues that need to be dealt with, right? But the ultimate thing is to dwell in obedience with love and joy in every family. That's what God wants. And when He comes into us, that's the, that's the point of God's dwelling in us that we would have joy, that we would have love, that we would have obedience. And that comes from God dwelling in us. And if you have God dwelling in you, and I have God dwelling in us, in me, and in you, and in you, right, guess what's going to happen? They will be obedience, they will be love, and they will be joy. And so the great question that you have is, well, why isn't that in my life? Right? Isn't that a great question? Why isn't that in my, why isn't that in my family? Well, we would have to you know, really look at it, and, and you yourself have to look at very those things. Are you obeying God's word? Are you abiding in God's word? Are you dwelling with him? And in, in doing so, are you also putting that and passing that on to your family and teaching them to love and teaching them to obey God and gets the result is going to be great joy. And so if we miss that in our lives, there's something, you know, because people will say, well, I don't see that in people. I talk to Christians. They're miserable. Hey, that's, what, that's what some people say about Christians, right? They're miserable. They're always complaining about stuff, right? But the reality is, okay, maybe a Christian, maybe not a Christian. I don't know. But the reality of it is, if he is a Christian, he will obey God, he would love, and he will have joy in that principle of dwelling together, right? Now, are there things in this world that are, are not joyful? Of course, they're not joyful things like that. But you know, despite these things, you have joy. And that's why God doesn't use the word happiness. Notice that too, right? We have it in our constitution, right? Love, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Even our founding fathers knew that you can never get happiness, because it's fleeting, so you have to pursue it and keep pursuing it and keep pursuing it. Do you ever get there? Not really. You know why? Because happiness comes from an old English word. I know, grammar school and literature, right? It comes from an old English word that means happenstance. 
happenstance, happiness. What is happenstance? Whatever's going on around you, whatever circumstances around you, will make you either happy or not. <laughs> right? So guess what? The Christian wants to be happy. It'll be going like this. Happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. But God never uses that word. What does he use the word? Joy. That's a difference between joy and happiness. Well, happiness, as I told you, deals with happenstance around you, right? I got fired. I'm sad. I got a raise. I'm happy, right? I got this new account. Yay! I didn't get the account. Blah, sad, right? Uh, it's, it's up and down. But joy is consistent because it's based on obeying God's word, having the love of God, and that will produce great joy in us. And so is God's, it's obeying the word of God something that we ought to do consistently? Yeah. It's his love consistent? Yes. So our joy tied to those two things will always be consistent. Like you may be going through the worst time in your life. And it's what, February 17th today? Or 18th, sorry, 18th. Miss a day. Uh, it's a leap year, so I'm catching up. I'll be you know, pretty soon. Right? But how many of us have had a really rough year already? Right? Already, just a rough year. You're like, man. Right? And some of us don't even want to admit because we're too weak to even admit it that it's been bad. But it's been rough for a lot of believers, right? Even then, God wants your joy to be full, right? But it's nothing to be happy about. I didn't say happy. I say joy because it's based on obeying God and having his love. And those two things, you would always have the love of God. I just don't know if we obey the word of God so many times, right? And therefore, it breaks down. It breaks down. Let me go. Let's go back to John 14. Uh, as you can see, Jesus is dealing with something very deep now. It's the dwelling place of believers. Do you have a dwelling place with God? Does he dwell in you, right? Do you dwell in him? And if you do that, do you dwell with other believers in the same way? You know, meaning unity, having a dwelling place with them, right? And that's why Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for us, and he will come again. The reason why he's leaving is he's preparing, and the reason why he's coming back is so that we will be together with them. In verse 2 and 3, that where I am, you may be also. And that's the way to the Father's house. The way to the Father's house is what Jesus was going to do. What was he going to do? The cross, his burial, his resurrection, right? That's the way to the cross. And it was hard, to be, it was hard for them to believe it. They thought they were just going to go to heaven. And they didn't think about the fact that Jesus must first die, must first be buried, and must first raise from the dead. But these are the words that Jesus left them. And so, of course, in verse 4, you know the way where I'm going. Where's Jesus going? The cross, burial, resurrection, glory. Confused? So was Thomas. Look at verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how do we know the way? Thank you, Thomas. You spoke for all of us. This is true. Notice that in the, in the scriptures is like that, right? Whenever you're confused about something, either the Pharisees ask the question or the disciples ask the question. Why? The Holy Spirit anticipated all of us being a little confused and knowing, like, what, what is Jesus talking about? Where is he going? We have a little bit of advantage, right? 2,000 years of hindsight. Verse 5, how do we know the way? And, of course, that led to the wonderful, wonderful verse 6. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, Thomas. I am the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. If you know the Father, if you know the Father's way, it is me. If you know how to get to the Father, it is only by me. There is no other way, is what Jesus is saying. There is no other truth. There is no other truth because he is the truth. There is no other life. If you want to have life, you have to come through me. Now, this is an amazing statement of Christ. It is him, but it's also to the Father, right? Maybe the way to the Father. It is, it is the point of getting into the dwelling place of the Father's house. How are you going to get there? Jesus makes it clear. He is not the, he doesn't point to the way, as some people would say. He doesn't just teach you nice principles that you ought to have, as some people have, uh, have said about Jesus. Do you remember Gandhi? You ever heard of Gandhi? Gandhi from India, right? Um, Mahatma Gandhi believed that uh, Jesus was, was a great teacher and a wonderful example. And he said that Jesus pointed to the right way of living. And Gandhi died. And apart from Christ, he's not in heaven. He's in hell. But what, what did he miss? He talked about Christ. He said the similar things that we would say he talked about peace and love, right? Gandhi said Jesus pointed to the way. 
That means that Jesus was only a pointer to the way you ought to live. And the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says Jesus is the way. He's actually the person that you need to walk with in order to find eternal life. And so, you know, people have followed Jesus on the basis of, well, he teaches nice principles. He teaches us to obey the Ten Commandments. He teaches us all these things. No, Jesus actually said, if you follow me, you will fulfill God's word. He actually made it a point that it's not a, a principle that you're following or dogmas or philosophies. It's actually following a person, following a, a real person, having a relationship with a real person. Well, we, don't know how to, we know how to have a relationship with a real person, don't we? Right? Somebody's next to you, right? You have a relationship with them. I didn't say a good one or a bad one. You said you know how to have a relationship. Now, the point of having a relationship is to have a good one, isn't it? Well, how do you get a good one? Well, you have to dwell with them. You have to understand them. You have to go back and forth with them, right? Knowing that, you know, they're just as much sinful as you are and, and have to have forgiveness toward them. But Jesus doesn't have any sin. He's perfect. I'm the one that has to change because I'm the one who has sinned. And so I have to abide in what he says, and I have to abide in, in his love and his joy so that it may be full in me. No, so the disciples understood one thing. The only way they were going to have any spirituality in their lives and any spiritual blessing in their lives was going to be through Jesus. That's the one thing they got right away. And, you know, when I was not a Christian, I used to read some of this stuff, right? When I was not a Christian, I used to read about Eastern religions. Interesting. Talked about it a little bit on Thursday. Um, yeah, you could read about Buddha. You can read about Hinduism. You can read about Islam. You can read about these things. Some curious things. The one curious thing I found is not as not as a, as, as a, as a as not a Christian. I was not a Christian, but one thing I found out is that every single one of these religions talked about Jesus. Do you know that? Interesting. What does what does Islam say about Jesus? He is a prophet. Hmm, I thought it was interesting. I'm like, I thought they didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. No, they say he was a real person and he was a prophet. Well, what does uh, Buddha, what does Buddhism say about it? Well, they believe he was the incarnation. He was one of the manifestations and incarnations of the Buddha. That's what they said about Jesus. What about Hinduism? Well, Hinduism said that he is the incarnation of one of their gods. And in Hinduism, you can have a Christ consciousness. Like the Mahashyogi, you know, the guy that taught the, the Beatles how to do all that yoga stuff, right? The Maharishi Mahashyogi, right? Or the uh, uh, Yanaganda. These guys taught about the Christ consciousness. But they didn't say anything else, right, about Jesus except that. What's interesting is every one of those religions said Jesus is one of the ways. They all admit it. He is one of the ways. They all had some things about Jesus. Oh, well, when I was not a Christian, I thought that's interesting. They all, they had nothing in common, these religions, except one thing. They all said Jesus is one of the ways. So I started reading a Bible, my Bible. And my Bible said that Jesus didn't agree with these guys because Jesus said he is the way, right? The bizarre thing is they all have some things about Jesus, but only Jesus can tell you things about himself, right? And so this is how, uh, you know, one of the ways, this is, part of the testimony of how he became a Christian. It's like seeing how, wait a minute, what are these people saying about Jesus? Unique, isn't it? But Jesus doesn't want us to have a Christ conscious. Jesus doesn't want us to have him only as a prophet, or Jesus doesn't want us to have him just as some kind of, you know, visible incarnation of some God. What Jesus said is he is the God, the creator, and he is the way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. And so it, made Christian, it makes Christianity by far uh, the truth above all these other religions because they don't agree with each other. They don't even agree with Christianity, but the one thing they did agree, there was something about Jesus. And I would say that as a non-Christian, it was really interesting how it was, it was about Jesus. And it's, it's, it was God's way of pointing, it was Jesus. It was just up reading this crazy stuff, but it was about Jesus. Now, uh, in our world... We have ecumenism that's rising up. What is ecumenism? Ecumenism is basically an interfaith idea that all religions are the same. Right? All religions are the same, and Jesus is just one of the ways. Now, this is the, this is the world's thinking of today. We talked about the world and not being conformed to it in Romans 12 on Thursday. But the world's thinking is every one of these religions have some validity to it. It's just one of the ways. Well, remember, this is what they say, too. It's just one of the ways. And now it's a big movement with the Pope, 
and the Roman Catholic Church, it's all coming together and they're saying, well, we all worship the same God. We just call him a different name. And Jesus this is one of the ways. Buddha is one of the ways. That's what, it's exactly what I read when I was a young man and, and trying to figure out who was the truth. It's exactly the same way. Come full circle, become a Christian, and you see all these movements coming into the church. Do you know, sometimes we, we used to get eat, we used to get mail like that, you know, come and participate in our ecumenical movement at some place here in San Bernardino, and we're all going to get together, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Catholics, Hinduism, New Age, we're all going to get together because we're all pray to the same God anyway. Now, we don't get those anymore. I think they took us off our list because we wrote them a letter saying, nope. John 14, 6, our Bible and our faith claims that Jesus is the only way. He's the only true God. He's the only true creator. So there is no other way, and there is no other truth. And what Jesus is saying here is all these other beliefs are lies. I know in our world, it's the, 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 the biggest sin you can make in this world is to insult somebody, right, or, or to offend them. <gasps> right? But according to Jesus, they're all lies. According to Jesus, it's all death because he's the only life, right? And so... Christianity is not a set of rules or philosophies. That's what these religions are. Christianity is a relationship with a person, a living person who died and rose again. And that person, of course, is Christ, is Jesus. And so it's not a set of dogmas or philosophies that I'm telling you to believe. What we teach in this church is to teach you to believe in a person who existed and dwell with us and still exists. And he is dwelling in each one of the uh, believers uh, and pointing to himself as the truth. And so we all have to come to the knowledge of the truth, and we all have to come to uh, abiding in that truth, and we all have to realize that Jesus is the only way. If you're gonna, if you're gonna make it anywhere in a spiritual world, in a spiritual life, and have anything of hope of eternal life, it has to have Jesus. Period. Nothing else, nothing less, no one else, right? Now, a friend of mine was visited by uh, um, a man, uh, he was in the ministry. And this man claimed to be some kind of Catholic mystic. I'm not sure what it was exactly, but he claimed to be. And he told my friend that, you know, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these other religions, you know, uh, we don't have to worry about witnessing to them. We don't have to worry about sharing the truth to them. We don't have to worry about giving them Jesus anymore. Why? Because Jesus said, he used this verse in verse 2, that the Father has many rooms. And so Islam has a room. Buddhism has a room. Hinduism has a room. Atheism has a room. So it doesn't matter what you believe because God has a room for all of us. Except for one thing. He never quoted verse 6 where Jesus says, if you want to go to that dwelling place, you're going to have to go through him. It's the great claim of Jesus that basically destroys every other belief system. No matter what it is and how sincere it is, the belief system, if it doesn't line up with Christ, it is an absolute lie. And, and, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it because the Father doesn't have different rooms for different religions. The Father has rooms for all his children, the believers, right? Those who believe in Jesus. And that's what Jesus is saying here. There's, there, there's not these room for different religions. It's room for true believers in Jesus coming unto heaven because Jesus said it. There's no, no one can come to the Father except through him. Fascinating, isn't it? Because so many people can take it in so many different ways and they claim to have some kind of spiritual meaning. But in reality, it leads you to hell in a Christless eternity if you follow these things. And the ecumenical movement is very big, by the way. It is very, very big and very powerful because it literally appeals to everybody's already preconceived ideas. I don't have to believe in Jesus. I could just believe whatever I want. I'm going to find my way there. Right? And, um, or as some people have said in the media, they couldn't possibly be only one way. Right? They say they couldn't possibly be only one way. Uh, now, there's a lot of problems with that statement because what they're saying is that they believe that there is no possibility of just one way, right? Just because they say it doesn't mean it's true, right? Just because they say it doesn't mean it's true. So anyway, let's continue on because that's what Jesus cuts at the heart of any kind of spirituality that wants to rise up to the point where it could deceive people into a Christless eternity. Now in verse 7, let's go to verse 7. Uh, if you had known me, you have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. So Thomas spoke about knowing how do we know the way? And Jesus says, you want to talk about knowing. Thomas, here it is. 
you can only, only know the Father if you know me. Fascinating, isn't it? If you had known me, you have known the Father, right? Thomas knows Christ, but he doesn't grasp who Christ is. He knows Christ. He's been walking with them for three years. But Thomas is asking for to know God. Like, how do we know the way? And Jesus is saying, if you had known me, you, have known, you would have known God. You didn't grasp the fact that when I was with you, you were literally walking with God. Now, you don't have to know another person is what Jesus is saying. You need to know me because by knowing me, you can know the Father. It is true. There are different persons. This is the, the, the mystery of the God. And I don't want to confuse anybody, but we're going to get into some deeper stuff here in terms of who God is and who Jesus is and who the Father is. But within God, there are persons. Here's the Father. And by knowing Jesus, you actually are knowing who the Father is. Verse 8, Philip said, remember, the confusion. Philip comes to our rescue. Lord, show us the Father. It is enough. And this is something unique. Verse 8, Philip doesn't understand. He wants to see the Father. Jesus said, have I been with you so long yet? You have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The response of Jesus is profound. The most profound words probably recorded in this chapter. In verse 9. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, what is he saying then? They have spent time with Jesus. They didn't know who Jesus was. He's not the Father. But if you see who Jesus is and who he is and what his character is, you absolutely get to know who God the Father is. Because there's no difference in terms of their character and their unity and who they are in nature as God. There's no difference. They are. The same. Yet there are two different persons. Verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, do not, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me. He does the work. Two separate persons. The Father and Jesus. Two separate persons. Quite unique. Two separate persons. Yet each one is in the other. The Father is in Jesus, and Jesus is in the Father. I don't understand that, Pastor. Well, neither do I. So you feel better, right? It is a unique mystery, isn't it? How can two people be different, different persons, right, of the Godhead, yet each one dwells in the other? And yet they're unique differently. They're uniquely and different. Yet we're, both, we're still dealing with the same God who has come to us in the person of Jesus. It is a wonderful mystery, but this is taught in Scripture. I'm not saying we're to wrap our head around and say, okay, I, I got it, I got how it works, because it doesn't. It, it, you'll have a hard time. Two separate people, both equal. Equally God, equal in nature, equal in character, right? But yet separate. Intimately, they are united as one being inside another. We can't understand, because there's nothing like that on earth. The closest we can ever even imagine, right, is a baby dwelling in a mom. Another person inside another. But the mom is not dwelling in the baby. You see where, the, where it breaks down? The baby is inside. He's a different person. He is inside his mom, but we don't have the mom inside the baby. That would be very interesting how it would work, right? And as bizarre as you think of that, that, that is where the triunity of the Godhead kind of breaks down in our mind because it doesn't, there's nothing like that. Another example that the Bible gives is actually the, 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 the unique person of who we are. God created us in his image and likeness. He gave us a body. I could see it. He gave us a mind, which has your will and emotions. Right? I could perceive it, <laughs> and I could understand it up to a point, Right? the way you think, the way you feel, the way you express yourself. Right? That's the mind. But then God also gave us a spirit, the deepest part of the person where the Holy Spirit dwells. I can't see that. I can't see that. Uh, only God can see it, and only you can perceive it by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Yet, all those three things are you. You're the body, <laughs> I can see it. You're the mind, I can hear it and express it. But yet there's a Spirit in you where the Holy Spirit dwells. But it's the same person, three and one, one and three, right? Teddy, you're still the same person, but there's three, three Teddies. <laughs> I can prove it. 
You ever been so tired? Yeah, you got home and you're just like so tired from work and you're like, and the Holy Spirit prompts you, go witness to your neighbor. He's outside. He's getting his mail. And you're just so tired and you're just like, you know what? I'm fed up with this. I had a rough day. I'm tired. Your spirit knows that you have to go witness to them. <laughs> you know it. It was like by far. You're like, and your body goes, nah, <laughs> you're too tired. And your mind goes, what do I do? <laughs> right? You, you, you get into this dilemma, right? Now, you're having a, literally a discussion with three people in here, right? The body's tired. The spirit wants to go. And your mind is caught in between knowing like, you know, should I go? Should I? You know, that's, your, that, that's how you deviate, right? And, and yet it's the same person, right? It, it's showing you that there is a unity, but because of the fall, there's a disunity in our bodies, right? The spirit should be controlling us and dealing with us and what to do, right? But because of the fall, your body's still kind of not in sync with what the spirit wants in your life, right? Now, there's no disunity like that in God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always in unity, always in concert, always loving each other, loving continually as God, one person. We don't. <laughs> we struggle with ourselves, right? We, we contradict ourselves, right? As it says, you know, every person like a civil war inside of them, right? Because you, you know what to do is right, but you don't do it, and you're struggling with what to do. God doesn't have that. But it's one example that we can think of that helps us understand God a little bit more, the Godhead, that there are three persons, unique, yet the same, dwelling in each other, right? When do we get to the Holy Spirit? Then we really confuse you because... The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus, right? So it's the, it's, the, it's the Spirit of Jesus coming to us as the Holy Spirit. Anyway, but the, yet they're all three, and they're all one, and they're all in unity. But the point is this. I believe when, you deal, when we read something like in verse 10, and we have no quite of understanding of how to deal with that verse, you know what that tells me? The Bible was not written by men. Why? Because I'm a man, and you are the human race too, and we don't write things we don't understand. None of us do. We don't write things we don't understand. And so this is why I believe the Bible is so unique, because it gives you concepts and, and ideas and verses like this that no man can understand. No man could have written this because man is too egotistical to write something he doesn't understand. And so if this was written by man, guess what? It would have given you a nice academic definition of God, <laughs> and you would have been happy with it, right? Because we could be, oh, I understand it. But because it's so, it stretches your mind and your imagination to say, how can this be? How can three become one and one become three? And, and yet one dwells inside of the other person, but they are two different people, two different persons. Because it's written in such a powerful, mysterious way, that is hard for our minds in this world to understand it. It's one of the reasons I believe the Bible is it's inspired. Because it is written in a way that man could not have written it. They could not have understood the Trinity. Therefore, it's unique. It's something powerful that God gave us. So that it's taught in the Bible, but we have a hard time understanding it. Right? We, we could accept it, and that's why I believe the Bible is not fake. It is real because one person inside of another they are two different persons, yet they're uniquely one. Verse 10. Do you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? Yes, I do, Jesus. I believe you, but I don't understand it. But the Lord doesn't ask us to understand it. The Lord is, look, look at the first word, right? Believe. Do you believe? Yes, Lord, I do believe. I, I, I trust that that's what you're saying is true, because you're not a man that you should lie. God's not a man that he should lie. He became a man, but God's not a liar. These words that... I told you, right? They're from the Father. Look at verse 10. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative. They're from the Father. He does the work. What Jesus said, he attributed to the Father. He said, the words I have, they're, from, they're not from me. They're actually comes from the Father. I just, I listen to what the Father is saying and I repeat them. So believe the words that I'm saying to you. Believe them. If you don't believe my words then believe the works that I've done. Verse 11, believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe the works for themselves. Okay, if you don't believe my words, then at least believe what I've done. You know, at the time of Jesus, nobody denied Jesus did this. In the book of John, there's seven signs that 
John focuses in on, these are the signs that you would recognize Jesus, who he is, the Messiah. And there's seven of them. And he called them signs. They're miracles, but they're signs because they're much more than just miracles. They're pointers to the fact that only the Messiah could do that. He healed a blind man that was blind from birth. I believe he had no eyeballs, and Jesus gave him eyeballs in the book of John, chapter 9. There was a noble man that was healed, right? Uh, he walked on water. But the biggest sign, or the last one, was the resurrection of Lazarus, that people freaked out and they said, this must be the Son of God. There's nobody that can do that. There's nobody that can return a person's life back to them after they've been dead more than three days. Only Christ. At least believe, Jesus says, by the works that I've done. The works that I've done testify of me. Why? There's nobody else that could have done it. Did you know at the time, it's, we're... We're victims of this, and I say a victim in a nice way. We're victims of 2,000 years of history having from that point to now. And we're victims of rationale, German rationalism, meaning that we only believe natural things, right? If you can touch it, feel it, hear it, then it's true. And we have really have come to, as humanity, we don't believe in supernatural things anymore. We stop believing it, right? Because... We're rational beings, supposedly, right? Now, we can believe irrational things and yet still believe that they're true. But anyway, that's another story. At the time of Jesus, nobody argued these things happened or were real. Nobody argued. In fact, when Jesus died and rose again, when the message was preached about what Jesus had done, that he'd done all these miracles, nobody stood up and said, no, he didn't do it. That person's dead. Lazarus is dead. Nobody said that. Why? Lazarus was around eating. He, he, they saw him. He was eating. Nobody could say that the widow of Nain, you know, the, the, the son of the widow of Nain, was not alive. Nobody could say the little girl, Talitha Kumi, was dead. She was alive. Nobody fought against the miracles of Jesus. Everybody believed them. In fact, even his enemies never argued that these miracles were true. That should tell you something. The eyewitnesses of the miracles of Jesus never argued. They didn't like what he taught but they never argue what he did. And that's what Jesus is saying. You could disagree with my teachings, Jesus says, but can anybody do this? Can anybody else do what I've done? Raise people from the dead? And even more miracle, raise us who were born in sin and raise us up from the dead and give us eternal life. Who could do that? Who can bring a, man's, a change in a man's heart like that? Only Jesus Christ. Only by contact with the real person of Jesus is that people change. And that's a great miracle. Verse 12, oh, actually, this finished in verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe the works for themselves. We have to believe who Jesus is. To know Christ is to know the Father. To know the Father is to know Christ. To see the works of Jesus, they come from the Father. To hear the words of Jesus, they come from the Father. If anybody knows God, it's because they know Jesus. If anybody knows anything about God, it's because of Jesus. And that's what our Lord is saying. There is no way to know God except Jesus. You want to know God? Get to know Jesus. And there's an emphatic. And you know, uh, as we finish, this is the last verse of the day. Jesus goes on to tell you that if you pray to him, we'll deal with this next Sunday. If you pray to him, right, he will answer your prayers. Fascinating, isn't it? I don't think Christians believe that anymore. If you pray to him, he will answer your prayers. If your prayers are based on glorifying Jesus, meaning that your whole intent purpose is to glorify Jesus, then the Father will hear those prayers, and because the Father is glorified in Jesus, Jesus will answer those prayers if you seek his glory. And all that you do, if you pray and ask him, he will do it. Now, some people don't believe it anymore, right? They say, I don't have enough faith to do that. Well, have you ever done it? You ever ask Jesus, Jesus, could you teach me to glorify you today or this week? And I'm going to pray that you will show me how to glorify you. And you do that. And you take it seriously. And you go to Jesus in prayer. He says in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. So this week, you're going to meet people. You're going to talk to people. You're going to be in school. You're going to be at work. You're going to be on the phone. You're going to be in all kinds of different places, right? And as you talk to people this week, Ask the Lord to bring up the subject of God. I want to give you one example here. Most people, when they talk about God, they're okay with it. If you talk to somebody tonight about God, stranger, family, whatever, 
they'll be very okay with it if you talk about God in general. Why don't people have any issues talking about God? Because when you say God, in their mind, they made up who their own God is. Meaning, meaning that they can make up whoever they want to talk about God. But mention Jesus, and the conversation go completely the other way. Why? Because Jesus is a real historical person who lived in this world, Jesus of Nazareth, who died in this world, who resurrected in this world, and there's more evidence of that, amazing evidence that you could ever imagine. And as soon as you start talking about Jesus, guess what happens to people? They get intimidated. They feel threatened. Why? Because now you're not talking in vague generalities. You're talking about truth in time and space, right? You're talking about reality that comes to us in the person of Jesus. That's why they get mad at you and me, when we bring up Jesus, bring up God, it's okay. They made up in their mind whoever God they think it is. And they might be thinking they're God. So that's another story, right? But you mentioned Jesus. The fact that you need to talk about Jesus this week, it's imperative, right? Because it really cuts through the heart of what people think and believe. And you would say, it's impossible. I'm not going to talk about Jesus. I mean, they're going to ask me questions. And when they ask me questions, I'm not going to know what to answer. This is where prayer comes in. Lord, I'm going to talk about you this week. And they might give me a question that I don't know how to answer. Would, would you give me the wisdom to know what to say when that happens? And you ask God to do that, that he will be glorified in that conversation. Why? Because when you give him that answer, they're going to be taken back at what God is able to do in you, what Jesus is able to do in you and give him that answer that they need. It might be a difficult question, right? And you might have to come back to them again. But ask God to show you, to give you that answer that they may ask so that you won't be afraid of bringing up Jesus to people. Or you might be dealing with a problem. A question may come up, a question uh, that you need an answer, ask God for wisdom. How about a situation may come up? In that situation, you need to have wisdom and knowing what to do. Ask the Lord today. Ask the Lord today, Lord, I want to glorify you in this situation. I don't know if I should go this way. I don't know if I should go that way. I'm caught in between. Lord, I don't know what to do, but I'm holding on to your promises that if I ask anything, you will come through and you will give me the wisdom to know which direction to go. Ask him to do it and he will do it. The question is, do we believe him? And that's why I titled this message, Believe Jesus. Because all through the chapter, all through the verses we read today, he keeps coming back. Believe in me. Believe the works. Believe the words. Believe in me as you believe in God. Because there's no other way to God. There's no other way to know God today except Jesus Christ. So if you have decisions this week, if you're going to bring up Jesus this week, he'll come through. He may not be visible to you. And this is what he's going to teach us this, this week. He might not be visible to you today. But when you see him working in your life, in your prayer life, and what you ask him, then you will have no doubt that the Lord Jesus is right with you, right where you needed him to be. You know, the disciples had to learn that. Every disciple has to learn that, by the way. The disciples had Jesus for three years. They turned, he was there. They walked with him, he was there. They ate, he was there. One day, he went to the cross and died for our sins. Rose again, and he was with them for about six weeks, and then he ascended. And for that point on, they never physically saw Jesus again. But what did Jesus say? I am going to leave you my spirit. And they, they, they had to learn how to walk with Jesus without him being visible. They had to walk with Jesus in a way that needed faith more than anything else. And that's what he's teaching us today. We need to have that real relationship with God that does not require visibility of Christ. One day we will see him face to face, the Bible says. But today we walk by faith. But it's because he's invisible, does it mean he's not there? No! It actually, he encourages us to to prove the fact that he is there by praying and asking him to do something in your life that will glorify him and glorify the Father. So this is where the real test comes in for believers, right? Not needing a visible presentation of Jesus, but walking by faith and asking him to reveal himself more and more in your life through prayer and asking him to do a work in your life that nobody else can do except for him. He's already started. He's already started but he will continue the good work in us. 
and sanctifying us, bringing us closer to himself. And that's the whole point of John 14. Get to know Jesus. Because if you want to get to know God, you need to get to know Jesus. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for all your blessings and goodness. We thank you for this marvelous passage, Lord God, that teaches us more and more about our great need for him, our great unity that is needed in every church, in every believer, in every family. Lord God, there's a great need for joy and peace and love and obedience. And Lord, and that can only come through a relationship with you. Lord, we see that so many in our world and our society are so caught up with all different ways, different ways to God, Eastern religion, ecumenism, these things, oh God, are false and lies. But you are the truth. But you are the way, Lord. You are life. And so we ask you, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself in our lives as we seek to glorify you. Lord, may you Manifest yourself in a powerful way in our lives this week as we bring you up to our co-workers and friends and family. Lord, may we not be afraid. May we not be afraid to bring your name up because we love you so much. We want them to know you so much. And we pray, Lord God, that you would help us in answering their questions, Lord God, and you would help us in making decisions in our life that would glorify you. Lord, you promised that you would answer our prayers if we seek to glorify you. Lord, you promised that you'll be with us even till the end of the age. And Lord, you promised that if we seek you, we are seeking God. And God is only to be known through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, thank you for being our Savior, our personal Savior, the God who came to us, in the, per, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. We glorify you, Lord. We worship you. We, we, we adore you, Lord God, because you are um, our life. You are, Lord, the truth. You are the way. And no one will ever, Lord God, ever be in heaven except through the cross and the resurrection. We praise you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Let's all stand.